We have um, three presenters. We have Dr. Uh, Francisco Cacavo. He's a consultant on medical devices and health technology assessment. He has a MD in medicine in, from Argentina. And he's going to present us um, some aspects, uh, some regulatory aspects uh, on the use of um, respirators. Then we have Dr. Valeska Steinbluck. She is a um, nurse by the University of Sao Paulo. She was the former regional IPC expert here in Washington, uh, D.C., and currently working in Jamaica as an advisor on prevention control of uh, communicable diseases and uh, also supporting countries in the COVID-19 response. And finally, we have Dr. Silvia um, acosta Gnas. She's um, the Director of Infection Prevention Control Department in California, uh, United States, in the Riverside University Health System Medical Center. She has a um, Master's of Science in Microbiology uh, from Spain. And um, under her CV, she was the former Director of uh, IP Infection Prevention Control Department um, in the um, Sanatoria Adventista del Plata, Entre Rios, Argentina, uh, in the um, for the past um, twelve years. So for these uh, today's sessions, we are not opening the the microphones, but we have. Um, we have the, um, the chat for questions and answers. Both the recording and the presentations will be available uh, on our um, web page and we'll share with you within the next 24 hours. And uh, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Francisco Cacavo to start the, the webinar. Francisco, the floor is, is yours. Just give me a second to give you the um, role of presenter, over. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is a pleasure to be uh, here uh, with you today. Um, I'm seeing uh, a different presentation. I'm not sure uh, how can I change uh, the presentation here. I think you can you can change the presentation. If you can't see, just let me know, and I'll. Um, no, you can. Maybe. So I'll I'll change it for you. Okay, thank you. Because I saw just just one. Uh, if you can uh, put my presentation, that would be great. Thank you, Joao. Okay. On um, the meantime, as I was saying, uh, as Joao mentioned, today we're going to present a report we have recently developed conjunctly between the unit of medicines and health technologies, and uh, Joao and Maliska Sebluk from the Control of Infectious Diseases area. Uh, about technical and regulatory aspects of the extended use, reuse, and reprocessing of respirators during shortages. Um, I don't know, Joe. Maybe we can uh, I can try to to upload it again. Or the presentation is already uploaded here on my on my screen. I don't know if you can see the presentation. No, yes. we can't. You so no. Maybe so, you are sharing your our, our screen, John? Uh, yes, I'm sharing oh, the files. I yeah. think um, that's mine. Stop the share. Okay, now, right? Yes. Now, now we can. Mine. Now, okay. now we can see. Sorry. Okay. Uh, now uh, here we are. Well, I was saying we're gonna uh, share. We're gonna. Uh, discuss uh, about this document we've made uh, conjunctly uh, between the unit of medicine and health technologies and Joao Baleska from the control of infection disease area uh, about uh, technical and regulatory aspects of the extended use, reuse and reprocessing of respirators during shortages. Uh, I'd like to mention, uh, so for, just for you to know that all the tables, charts, cited documents from these presentations can be found on the report. Uh, so, uh, the, the report is available in Spanish and it will, it will be available in English uh, within a few, a couple of days. It's already been translated and it's being reviewed. The audience is uh, regulatory authorities, healthcare facility managers, 
and uh, decision makers, all kind of decision makers on the use and prioritization of PV. As you may see, it's a pretty recent document from May 18, 2020. Um, so first of all, what are we going to talk about? N95 are part of a category uh, called uh, filtering face disc respirators, FFR. This means that all the air inhaled by the person wearing the device is filtered. Unlike, for example, face masks that provide a barrier protection. N means it is not resistant to oil or solvents, and 95 that it filtrates at least 95% of particle, particles bigger than 0.3 micrometers. It is made uh, of several layers of non woven synthetic material triggered to have an electrostatic charge. It's the electrostatic charge that actually blocks particles and pathogens. It provides adequate protection against most airborne pathogens in healthcare settings. Uh, very important, it needs to have an airtight seal with the face. Uh, this is very important. There should be no filtrations when inhaling or exhaling around the respirator. Well, its use is indicated to provide direct care to patients with diseases transmitted, transmitted by droplets or aerosols or during aerosol generating procedures. Uh, well, so it's obvious now why we are seeing this now because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, why do we say N95 an equivalent? I'm not going to go in, deep, in detail here. You can check uh, more in the document, but the N95 standard, though it's very extended, it's a standard of the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, that's NIOSH of the United States. In Europe, the nearest equivalent is FPP2 devices that filtrate 94% of particles greater than 0.6 micrometers. So according to PAHO's list of priority medical devices in the context of COVID-19, developed also by the units of health technologies and medicine here within PAHO, uh, which you can access on this link as well, N95 or FF2 must permit good breathability and have a design that does not collapse against the mouth and be in compliance with any of the standards listed here. I'm not going to go into detail, but you can see in N95, FF2, FDA, and uh, EU regulations. Also, the FDA issued an emergency use authorization during the pandemic emergency for the standards listed here uh, to be considered equivalent to N95, that is only during the context of the pandemic the emergency of the pandemic emergency. So the, the, the standards here on the right are to be considered equivalent by the FDA during the context of the pandemic. So as we know, during the context of the pandemic of COVID-19, the need of PPE and specifically respirators is increased and can get to produce shortages. So the first measure is to implement strategies to optimize the availability of respirators. There's a WHO document on rational use of PPE. You can have access on the link here. The first strategy is to implement measures that minimize the need of respirators. Also, I'm not gonna go into deep detail, but how can we do this? By, for example, implementing telemedicine and telephone hotlines for the evaluation and follow-up of patients, uh, by grouping or cohorting patients with confirmed diagnosis, this is a very important one, and minimizing access to rooms by bundling activities such as checking vital signs during medical mitigation administration, for example. A second one is uh, to ensure rational and appropriate use of respirators. Uh, it's one of the most important measures. Only healthcare workers involved in direct and close care of patients with confirmed or suspicious diagnosis, and also those performing aerosol generating procedures should wear N95 respirators. This measure alone can, can go very far. And uh, coordinate the supply of uh, the supply chain management mechanism. Uh, in this context of extraordinary demands, and uh, it is, this is especially important. It's very important that those responsible uh, may, uh, make rational and explicit forecasts of supply needs, promote centralized request management approach, avoid duplications. Well, if once these measures are applied, there is still shortage of respirators, further measures can be taken. 
But it's uh, very important to know that these measures are temporary and exceptional. Its implementation should be minimized because they present limitations and hazard, and normal procedures should return as soon as possible. So these measures are the ones we see here, uh, extended use, limited reuse, and reprocessing, which we're going to see in these three, we're going to see in more detail, and they are in uh, order of preference. Okay, so uh, the first one is extended use of respirators. It means using the same respirator for the care of several patients without removing it between patient encounters. It is especially useful when patients are cohorted, I mean, together in rooms or areas. Uh, the usage time should not exceed the six hours, and it presents some limitations, as we mentioned before. Uh, it can uh, cause facial dermatitis, uh, respiratory fatigue, impaired work capacity, elevated CO2 levels, and the most important is that it increases non-compliance with best practices while wearing the respirator and increases the chance of health workers touching the mask or having inadvertent under mask touches. So, sorry, there. Then uh, we have extended use of respirators. I'm sorry, but this uh, little banner was supposed to be, uh, I don't know if you, there was an animation here. So extended use of uh, respirators, I mean, removal criteria, uh, when to, to remove it. If the face seal is lost, if it becomes wet or if it becomes uh, damaged or if it's difficult to breathe through, if it is exposed to splashes or chemicals, infectious substances or bodily fluid, and if it is displaced from the face for any reason. So one thing I'd like to stress, and it's very important, is the one that's here on the little orange banner, is that extended use is recommended over reuse, which is the next strategy we're going to see now, since um, reuse requires the manipulation of poten potentially contaminated masks, or I mean respirators, and the implementation of a complex protocol. Uh, which is something that needs to be highly prepared in advance, and uh, that's why extended use uh, is a better recommended strategy. So, as we were saying, limited reuse of respirators is the second strategy that can be used. It means using the same respirators for multiple patient encounters, but removing it and storing it after every, every encounter. So saying it requires the establishment, the establishment of a re reuse protocol. Uh, it, it needs to have a designated storage area and have single use, clean, breathable containers. There on the right, we see an envelope uh, that has the name of, a, of the professional that is wearing it, the date, then the, the container should be uh, discarded. Uh, and also, well, clear identified containers, as I was saying, single wear, wear. And very important, hand washing with soap and water or sanitizer after donning, doffing, doffing or adjusting the respirator. So, risks and precautions, loss of feet. Uh, using uh, many times with reuse, the fit can uh, be damaged. So, it needs to be closely inspected. I mean, the respirator or the band can, or the, the seal on the nose can, can be lost. So it should be closely, the respirator should be closely inspected before reuse. And proper donning and doffing techniques should be followed and the seal should be checked. Also, one of the most important is that there's risk of it spreading the infection. Since the mask, the, sorry, the respirators, uh, once they are used, there's a protocol that they should be stored and then they should be reused. Then there's a risk that they are put somewhere uh, or touched by someone else or cause contamination. So this should be taken with really good care. And a strategy, a good strategy is to use a face shield over the respirator so to avoid the risk or to diminish the risk of contamination and also limit the number of reuses. 
maybe the manufacturer recommends something, but this is very unlikely because most, almost all of them are disposable just for single use. And it is recommended uh, for a maximum of five reuses, but this can be adapted as well. Um, so reprocessing of respirators. Uh, then there's a third strategy that is the decontamination of a respirator using disinfection or sterilization methods. No standardized and consolidated respirator reprocessing method yet. I mean, uh, the, all these technologies are still uh, kind of experimental. We don't yet have methods that are fully proof and fully standardized and accepted. So they should, all this should be considered only during critical shortages or the absence of respirators. So before selecting any method or considering to implement it, some issues need to be, uh, need to be considered. Uh, local regulations, the availability of decontamination methods of proven efficacy of respirator reprocessing, and the existence of validated local protocols. We're gonna discuss the first point, the other two points, Valeska is going to go into more detail. Of course, you can uh, check this up in the document with great more detail. So, as I was saying, um, local regulations. Any N95 reprocessing method that is going to be adopted must be regulated by the competent local regulatory authority. Until now, only FDA and Health Canada have issued regulations for the authorization of equipment and reprocessing procedures. And these are the Brazilian Regulatory Authority issued some technical notes establishing uh, the, what needs to be in the protocol of health facilities that intend to do N95 reprocessing. FDA issued a compulsory compliance policy, that's the name, with the basic requirements that the contamination process should meet before submitting the EUA request. Health Canada aligned, aligned itself with the FDA criteria. So here on the right, for your reference, you can find uh, these requirements. They're explained with, with further detail on the report. Uh, so it's basically reduce pathogen burden, maintain performance, demonstrate acceptable residual limits, and provide, they need to provide adequate labeling to users and reprocessors. So, well, these are the only five method, methods that received emergency use authorization by now by the FDA. They all share the same principle, hydrogen peroxide. Valeska is going to explain it with more detail later. And also, you can have more uh, information on the report, of course. As you may see, they are all uh, pretty recent. The, the newest one, the latest one, is on May, May 7th. So, when there are no regulations on respirator reprocessing on the competent jurisdiction, NRAs can rely on regulatory decisions and information from other NRAs. Uh, I mean, national NRAs is uh, national regulatory authorities, sorry. So, the Unit of Medicine and Health Technologies here in Bajo recently released this document on the usage of decisions of other NRAs to authorize the emergency use of technologies during the pandemic. It's only available in Spanish uh, for now, but I assume it will be in English and it's certainly very, very useful. So NRA should at least request the following, local validation testing, a, a process protocol, and training of healthcare workers. So I'm gonna be, go a bit more into detail on, on this. So training of healthcare workers. Uh, it should include both the handling of used respirators and the proper use of reprocessed one, ones. The local valida validation testing. It's very important. Information obtained from studies cannot be directly extrapolated to local premises. It's very important to at least validate that the respirators preserve their shape and fit after using the selected method for reprocessing and to establish a maximum number of reprocessing cycles. And of course, and this, also, this is also very important and should uh, the adequate uh, attention should be paid to this. 
A detailed protocol of the process should be requested as well. It should contain, it should consider uh, human resources, equipment, procurement of consumables, health worker safety. It should contemplate the usage of specific containers, a labeling system to ensure the respirator returns to the same user, and to count the number of reprocessing cycles, and um, also a procedure for disposal uh, of the respirators as well. Well, um, I think this is it on my part. So thank you very much. This is my email in case of, of any of any inquiries, any questions. And uh, so now I give uh, the floor. I understand to Valerica. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Francisco, for your presentation. Um, now I'll give the floor to Dr. Uh, Steinpluk to present some highlights in the sterilization and disinfection process in the context of the COVID-19. Um, and finally, we will have Dr. Uh, Nas presenting her um, experience on the reuse uh, and reprocessing of the um, respirators. I'll just need to make a change here so Valeska can upload her presentation. Just give me a second. We can we can see your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to me uh, be here today with all of you. Um, as mentioned before, I'm Valeska Stimplu. I'm advisor in health surveillance prevention and control at PAHO Jamaica Country Office and a former. Uh, Personal advisor for infection prevention and control, and during this response, I'm supporting the infection prevention and control uh, team and related with COVID-19. So, what I will talk to you or discuss with you today, very briefly, is about the fundamentals or some concepts um, about disinfection, the contamination of medical devices, just to to harmonize the concepts and then uh, Dr. Gnaz will, you know, um, explain a little bit more and, and make her comments about how she put in practice those concepts. So first of all, um, I'd like uh, to highlight this uh, article that was published by the end of January this year about the persistence of coronavirus in different surfaces. Um, I believe most of you are read, uh, saw, have the opportunity to saw this article. Uh, but this is just to show you that, you know, for different types of surface, those virus can survive, or virus similar to SARS-CoV-2 can survive for different times, uh, periods. So more close to the mask or the surface that you have in a mask look like uh, disposable gowns here, you can have a difference from 24 hours or two days. And in paper, we can have this virus surviving up to five days. Um, the good news that come actually also in this paper is that about the susceptibility of this, uh, this virus to disinfectant. And then we can see in this table that for most uh, common one, common disinfectant that you use in hostel settings and also uh, in the ho our house or community, uh, these virals uh, are very weak against that. So um, you can see in this below part of this table, for example, for hydrogen peroxide, uh, the contact time of one minute is enough to uh, kill these virals and make uh, the surface clean. Uh, one important concept that is um, a challenge during this process of reprocessing of N95 is because we consider the contamination process a process of at least two steps, cleaning and sterilization or cleaning and disinfection. And the cleaning is the part here that is jeopardized because we cannot clean the N95. So we have this extra challenge of sterilization without cleaning and this is something that, you know, putting risk and 
Dr. Genas will discuss a little bit more uh, about the importance to have extra care with the healthcare workers who will manipulate this mask to to be to perform the disinfection or sterilization process. So this is important and it's also important to highlight that for all other articles that we are uh, sterilizing in, in our health settings, all the process need to be followed, cleaning, disinfection and sterilization. And we are breaking this uh, gold rule because it, this a uh, very challenging situation that we are facing right now. Um, so mentioned before uh, by Dr. Francisco, there are three fundamental aspects uh, about this reprocessing of respirators. The first one um, is the local regulation of reprocessing of medical devices. There is ethical and also legal implication about this reuse or reprocessing of uh, article that is a single use um, article. So this is very important to you to consider and discuss with a broad audience uh, about these uh, aspects about their local regulation. The second one is availability of recognized effective sterilization methods for reprocessing of respirators. Uh, we know that not all the facilities have, has all the technology needed for reprocessing. Um, in general, and reprocessing of respirators is even more challenge. So uh, there is few uh, that are already discussed and you know show and be uh, effective against uh, or uh, effective for steril as a sterilization methods. So we need to to make sure that we are using one technology or methodology that is effective for sterilization. And the third one is. Um, validation of or validate local protocols for reprocessing of respirators. From hospital to hospital, facility to facility, the situation is different, the conditions are different, even if you are using the same uh, effective sterilization methods. So in your hospital, you have to have a written protocol on how to do that uh, to make sure that by the end of the process, you guarantee the safety uh, of the healthcare workers who are using these uh, any respirators again, and also the safety of the you know the healthcare workers who do the reprocessing or uh, handling this uh, material. Um, so until the the date that we publish this uh, this uh, document, there were um, four methodologies, but three. Um, active principles uh, that we have been reported or have been evaluated for, for these, the contamination or sterilization of respirator. The first one is the uh, steam under pressure, saturated steam under pressure that is autoclave. And the second one is UVC radiation. And the third one is uh, gas plasma or hydrogen peroxide vapor that are two technologies using the same principle and we, we are discussing a little bit about uh, each one of those um, that can be used and has been reported as effective for this process. So the, about the gas plasma or uh, hydrogen peroxide vapor, uh, they are very well known in a hospital setting. Many hospitals, health facilities using this process for sterilization of heat sensitive medical materials. Um, they killing the microorganism by oxidation. Um, we have these two different technologies. One is high uh, hydrogen peroxide, peroxide gas plasmas that um, mostly are the brand is, you know, we still had or uh, GPG, HPGP, and then you also have uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, vapor that are uh, another kind of technology. So this is one that has been proven and, and Silva has experience with that, so she will share with, with us. The next one is um, uh, autoclave, that uh, process that almost in everywhere we use for sterilization of medical material. Uh, 
Um, the, the challenge here is because this is um, mostly used for um, materials that can support the heat of the process. And then what we saw in the, in the literature that they are uh, validating process that you are sterilizing the materials at 121 uh, degrees Celsius for 15 minutes. And in most of the, the health centers or facilities, what you will have is 134 degrees Celsius as a cycle for sterilization um, because it decreases the time. So if your autoclave doesn't have the cycle 121 degrees Celsius uh, validate, that will be a challenge because you need to validate the cycle before you'll be able to use this process. Of course, the big advantage that because it's low cost and as I mentioned, is wide available. And the third one is uh, ultraviolet radiation. Um, it has been used in a hospital for, you know, the contamination of air, water, surface. Um, it's very much known for uh, TB uh, control in some settings. However, we, in, in general, in, a, in our region, the hospital doesn't have this technology for uh, the contamination or sterilization of medical materials. So if you are planning to start to use this, uh, you have to, you know, uh, learn a lot about the technology and how you will be able to, to start to use, and that will be a learning process because it's new for the most of the health service. Uh, this use of this technology for reprocessing of medical uh, material. Um, so, having said that, I'd like to highlight some risks and, and limitations of this process. Um, the first one, and I think it's very important to highlight that uh, all the evidence that we have uh, are very new. Uh, so, in some cases, it is not even being published in a peer-reviewed uh, uh, journal. So it's important that we, we understand that there are limitations about, about the evidence that um, have been published. And of course, it's uh, constantly evolving. So it's very important to you to keep updated about what you have in new about in this area. Uh, there are just a few protocols that to guarantee the integrity of the respirators uh, after the reprocessing. And uh, this re is related with, you know, keep the CO or even the, the um, uh, filtration property. So all these uh, need to, to be considered by the end of the process. And there are just a few uh, protocols that shows that it can be done. So the shelf life of reprocessed respirators, uh, as you still know, um, as mentioned, the degradation of the filter or, or the elastic ties after one or more sterilization set uh, need to be considered. And we need to know uh, if for different, different methodologies, different uh, differences will be found in, in these two aspects, for example. Um, the shape during the reprocessing uh, can also affect the fit of the mask. And as we all know, uh, N95 need to have a perfect fit to be uh, useful. So that's also important to consider by the end of the process or during the validation process. And also, we don't know yet, and it's depending on the reprocessing method, uh, the maximum number of reprocessing cycles. So. That's why it's so important to have validate for your hospital because that will depending on the methods and also uh, on the brand of the, re the respirator that you have. So this is my last slide. This is the web PAHO web page where you can find the, the recommendation. Uh, and it was just to you know make the set for for Dr. Guinness explain a little bit more how she put all this uh, in practice. And um, I, I'd like, again, to thank her for her availability to please stay with us uh, today. And, and so, Sylvia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, um, Dr. Steinpluk and Dr. Gnas. I'll just give me a second to give you the, the floor so you have the rights to present her. And uh, in the meantime, just to, to highlight that uh, both the recording and the presentations will be made available uh, shortly, soon after the, um, the webinar is over. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please use the, the chat. And uh, we have, uh, no, sorry. Sylvia, I think you need to share your screen again. Yeah, no, that's mine. Just a second. Uh, the problem is with me here. So, uh, Dr. Gnas, you can share your screen. Yes, now we can see. Thank you very much. Over. Thank you. Let me see, because I don't see you. That's fine. You won't see us, but we can see both you and your presentation. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you here this morning, and thank you for the invitation um, to having me here to share this um, experience. was a little hectic the last month, and I hope uh, you found useful. Um, let me see if I can, okay. Okay, we are going to share the, the experience on reprocessing N95 mask in our hospital. The objective of this project was to increase the capability of our hospital to safely and effectively, effectively uh, decontaminate and reuse the N95 mask. Uh, reusing disposable N95 masks is used as an increases capa capacity strategy to conserve a viable of supplies during a pandemic. It's not for continuing to use it, even that maybe administrator or purchasing personnel is looking at a very good solution. This is only temporary, it's not forever. It's only until we get more masks. The, um, it's important to recognize that the surface of the N95 mask may become contaminated while filtering the inhalation of the air of the wearer during the exposure to pathogen-laden aerosols. Um, we have to be in uh, conscious that the mask, once it's used, is contaminated. The pathogens on the surface of the N95 mask may be transferred to the wearer in different activities. For instance, when we are adjusting our N95 mask, when we are removing the, the doffing the N95 mask improperly, or uh, when we are performing the seal check when using a, a previous worn N95 mask. These are the the situation more often than we can contaminate our hands and our face after uh, touching the mask. What we were doing in our hospital in this last month is a combination of the three process that uh, Francisco and Valetka were talking about. The extended use, the limited use, and the reuse. We almost use all of them <laughs> because not because we want it because it is not only a shortage on masks it's a shortage on every supply and then it was very difficult to have everything functioning um, the extended use of n95 masks has to be the last resort first we have to apply a strategy for optimizing the supplies of n95 respirators and this was a very 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 sad lesson that we learned because when we started the pandemic, I went to the purchasing department and I say, how we are, how, how many masks we have? And they say, no, we have plenty, no problem. One month later or less, 
few weeks later, um, two or three weeks later, we were in this big problem of um, requiring um, reusing the, the, the N95 mask. Also, we had um, KN95 mask that also we started to reuse in. But what we did is implemented covering the N95 or the KN95 mask with a regular mask and a face shield. That way, uh, we can increase the duration of the N95 uh, uh, mask. Uh, one important thing, we make everybody to write the name on the mask and save it in a brown paper bag when it's not in use. Um, every time you have to use a new paper bag. This was very important because um, the paper bag gets contaminated the first time. Then when you are wearing the next time and you touch again, uh, you are uh, very easy to produce cross-contamination. The N95 or KN95 mask can be last at least for six hours of continuous use if it's not wet, dirty, and its integrity has not been compromised. Um, because we have a lot of patients, COVID-19 patients, then what we um, implemented was the cohorting in in the regular unit, the post-down uh, unit, and also in the intensive care unit. We have one intensive care unit for COVID patient, one post-down, and also one regular unit for COVID patient. Then it's easier to, uh, to have the extended use of N95 mask when you have your patient cohorted. The, Important thing that you have to to keep in mind that the, the wearing the same N95 mask for extended period is it, only about uh, possible if the the N95 mask is in good condition, is not soiled, is free from defects or damage, and must be capable of forming a seal of the wearer face. Uh, if nothing of that is um, um, in compliance, then change the mask if you notice that doesn't fit properly to your face. The limit use is the, the other element that we were using. Um, discard the, we in our hospital decide to discard the mask N95 after aerosolizing procedures. Discard, of course, if it's contaminated with blood or body fluid, and if it's used for a patient co-infected with another respiratory infection. Um, but what we implemented to to extend the 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 safety of the mask is to uh, cover the N95 mask with the N regular uh, mask and. Um, with a face shield, and this um, avoid the contamination of the N95 mask, plus protecting the face of the wearer. And the last thing was the reuse of uh, after the contamination um, of the N95 mask. Uh, again, this has to be the last resort. Always, first we apply a strategy for optimizing the supply of N95 respirators. The decontamination and subsequent reuse of N95 masks should only be practiced when N95 mask shortage exists. Once we get more N95 masks in the hospital, this measure should be stopped immediately. Because remember that we are decontaminating the mask, we are not disinfecting, not sterilizing, and it's impossible to wash the mask, then and we cannot never have the contamination or sterilization of the mask. Um, from all the methods that Valeska was recommending, we use three of them. The vaporizer hydrogen peroxide, the hydrogen peroxide plasma, and the UVC light. Um, that was the result of multiple tests, a review of scientific literature, and incorporation of the current institutional practice. In order to implement this, 
we wrote the protocol, not only for the wearer, for the for the healthcare worker in front line, also for the personal in CPD. We have to train both groups of people that take long time to train and teach and, and be available for questions. But the problem is when you change the method, you have to do all over with the new map. Um, after, uh, when, when we use the energy five mass reuse after the contamination, we have to have in mind several things, um, important aspects. One, inspect the respirator after each use prior to submission for the contamination, because if the mask is already with makeup or, or lipstick, uh, then uh, it's not worth it to decontaminate. Plus, we are using a very expensive method for decontamination, then don't, don't waste the money. Uh, discard the respirator with visible soiling, like a blood or damage. Do not use or do not send for the contamination dose. Uh, if you have N95 masks with cellulose-based material are incompatible with hydrogen peroxide decontamination process. Today, most of the masks are from synthetic material. Um, the number of times a respirator has been decontaminated is written in the respirator. For instance, uh, I use one time, then the respirator go to the CPD and they mark it with a, a, a permanent uh, a pen. And then the next time they mark again, that way we know how many times was reprocessed. And if there is any problem, we always tell the, the to the healthcare workers and also to the CPD, personnel to, to tell the supervisor. That way we can fix immediately. When we started uh, to reprocess the, the mask, we started with the vaporized hydrogen peroxide because we have these uh, machines to decontaminate the rooms for already two or three years. Then uh, we follow the, the same protocol that some Places, only six places in the United States are using and we implemented here. Um, the, the advantage of this process is that um, the hydrogen peroxide inactivates the viruses and is um, also uh, inactivated highly resistant spores. Uh, it's effective reducing the viral load. Um, the hydrogen peroxide vapor is good until 20 cycles. Uh, don't degrade filter quality or straps for the mask we were using here. Is no significant changes in on the structural integrity and fit of the mask, and have no significant reduction of filtration performance. Is a fast procedure we have in in ten minutes the 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 the, um, the contamination process but in three hours, the degasification. And this is available in few hours for the wearer again. The cons of this uh, process or system is you require trained personnel. Um, the HPV or hydrogen peroxide vapor system is dangerous. It has to be very, uh, the plate has to be very well sealed. And then uh, N95 mask should be returned to the original user. It's not that you send any mask or you reprocess and send it back to the um, healthcare workers. It um, sh should have to come back to the, the proper unit, to the proper healthcare worker. Uh, the data from a specific N95 model may not apply to other models. Um, in, the other problem that we have is the insufficiency of gas, time, and residue may pose a respiratory and skin hazard. The insufficient dosing may lead to insufficient decontamination. The hydrogen peroxide is a powerful oxidizer and presents a combustion and explosion risk, and also 
uh, with all the method, the face oil and makeup not to be a concern because uh, if the decontamination cannot be reached if the mask is contaminated with um, this uh, product. Well, we were running few weeks very smooth after teaching, after the protocol, everything was in place. Um, we have our indicators, everything in place. And one day, uh, the purchasing department said, we are run out of the hydrogen peroxide vapor, and it's in back orders, we cannot get more of the, this product. Then um, it, it will be in the market in eight or 10 weeks. Then we are in the middle of the battle, then we have to change our system immediately. This is why we thought, okay, we have an Esther rat in our uh, CPD department, then um, let's start with a hydrogen peroxide plasma. Then we have to write a protocol for hydrogen peroxide plasma. For the, uh, for the employee was similar because they, they have to learn how, um, where to put the dirty mask and how to collect the, the clean mask. We use the same system and for uh, the central processing department personnel was different. Um, the pros of this is the same for the hydrogen peroxide, inactivate the viruses, spores, reduce the viral load. Um, the only problem is that, um, remember with the vapor, we can have 20 cycles with this um, hydrogen peroxide is only two cycles. Um, the low doses uh, for two cycles doesn't degrade the fit is a good thing. It's no significant change on the structural integrity of um, fit of the mass. And there is no significant reduction or filtration performance if it's wrapped individual, individually. We saw some problem when it's wrapped in the big bag, all the mass together. Um, is available also in few hours. In there is little or non gaseous sterilizer remain in the mass. The cons of this uh, system is that you require also trained personnel, uh, and the, this system is dangerous also. Um, the N95 must, must to be returned to the original user. Uh, the other problem we have with both systems is that um, if the mask doesn't have the name uh, written on it or um, have a residue of makeup or any dirty solution in, in, on the mask, we have to throw away. And on all these times, at least 70% of the mask were uh, throw away because without name, we don't reprocess. Um, data for a specific N95 models may not apply to other models. Then we, if we have, uh, for instance, KN95, we cannot be reprocessing. Uh, the high doses of this um, plasma can reduce the filtration of the mass. There is um, insufficient um, of gas time and residue may for the respiratory and skin hazard and the insufficient dosing may lead to insufficient decontamination. And again, the, the makeup is a problem. Okay, we were running this at least four weeks and the machine broke down. And the company that has to come to make the service, they didn't come because of the COVID pandemic. We have a, a lot of patients in our hospital. We are a gov governmental hospital and we receive most of the county uh, patients here in our hospital. Then nobody wants to come to do the, the service of the machine. We have another machine, but we reserve it for the sterilization process of the medical uh, devices. Then we decide to use the UVC light. 
Then we bought it, this machine. We bought eight of this machine to put in the in the um, every unit. Um, but the machines uh, were they say, oh, it's going to be a delay. Oh, it's okay. We can wait in the meantime. Um, then we um, decide to go by the UVC light because have a lot of pros and the, the, the advantage of this is that the N95 keep the fit and filter performance after even 20 cycles. Um, the more, more or equal one joule per centimeter square of uh, UVC light inactivates the viruses similar to SARS-CoV-2 on N95 masks also inactivate the bacillus subtilis spores. Uh, we don't observe changes in the structural integrity of the mass, no significant effect on filtration performance. The N95 mass can uh, withstand multiple cycles, as I said before, even uh, some company were testing and they found until two, uh, 200 cycles um, supporting. Of course, the mass can become contaminated or dirty or uh, much before that, that number of cycles. Um, the good things have only a few seconds of exposure and is effective and reducing viral load also and is no known health risk. The uh, disadvantage of the using UV light is the use of the appropriate UVC source. Um, and let me tell you that a lot of companies are selling these machines um, from outside uh, that they are not uh, providing uh, machines for medical equipment, it's for domestic use. And we can use the domestic use machines for UVC light in our hospital um, because the way that is used for medical devices is between 250 and 270 nan nanometers. And for the domestic use is less weight. Then we cannot transpolate the, the experience for the UVC light uh, for domestic use in uh, hospital use. Uh, the problem also that we found is um, the UVC light doesn't reach the inner part of the N95 uh, layers and not in all the N95 models. The straps may not fully decontaminate, then we have to decontaminate with alcohol. And also there is shadowing uh, that blocks the UVC light, um, and then you don't have areas of the N95 mask uh, that are decontaminated. And also some damage uh, was seen when applied doses more than 120 joules for centimeter square, but we don't use this amount of dose. Um, also there is a thing odor after the decontamination that due to the ozone. Well, we were ready uh, waiting for the, for the machine and the machine never arrived. And we can wait. Uh, actually, yesterday, the company called us again and they said that the machine are going to be available for the end of July. Then in the meantime, what we did is um, home main machine. Um, we have two bull here in the, actually this is a toolbox machine, metallic toolbox. Then we have two bulbs in the, in the left and two bulbs in the bottom of the machine, uh, <clears throat> the box. And we, we put here a, a little rack, very, very separate the, the, the wires that way the light is not blocked. And then uh, we use a sensor to validate one joule per centimeter square dose. Um, because we had, it was a homemade machine and then we have to test it on some way, validate it. And then um, we don't have viruses in the hospital. Then 
uh, in the laboratory. Then um, I said, okay, if the this virus is because coronavirus is an envelope virus that have fat in the envelope, and it's very very easy to kill. Is the less difficult um, to kill a microorganism. Then go the the gram positive bacteria and then the gram negative bacteria. I say okay, let's use gram positive uh, one gram positive and one gram negative, and and confront to the UVC light and see what happens. Um, we create a broth, uh, a suspension of E. coli and a suspension of the staph epidermidis. Um, sorry. Um, we create a suspension equivalent to the 0.5 McFarland scale for anti biogram. And then um, from the suspension, we plate five a sterile blood agar for E. coli and five for staph epidermidis. And then uh, we uh, put the, the plate under the UV light in different times. Then in order to have a, some way, some control, we cover the half of the plate. You can see the plate here. And we cover, once was um, all the the bacteria was plated, then we cover with a piece of uh, paper the half of the plate. That way uh, the UV light doesn't hit all the entire plate, only the half. And see what happens. When we run 15 seconds, we are still, you can see some colonies of E. coli and some colonies, a lot of colonies of uh, staph epidemics. When we're 30, uh, 30, 30 seconds was um, less, um, less bacteria uh, survived. Um, 40, 45 seconds, well, there is two here uh, after 48 hours, I think it's contamination. And then 60 seconds and 75 seconds. Um, even that was covered the half, you can see the reduction in 75 seconds. Then uh, our conclusion was, because a 30 seconds was um, a important reduction, almost 100% of the bacteria was killed. Our recommendation is they contaminate the N95 mask 30 seconds, then turn one four just in case there is some area that was uh, with a shadow, and then they contaminate it for additional 30 seconds. And this is what we were doing. Um, the additional uh, use consideration is that always you have to clean the hands with soap and water or alcohol-based hand sanitizer before and after touching or adjusting N95 mask, because you are touching your face, your mucous membranes, and then um, uh, you are going to get contaminated. Remember this virus and most of the microorganisms also are transmitted with uh, contact uh, transmission. Um, avoid touching the inside of the N95 mask. Uh, use a pair of clean non-sterile gloves when donning the N95 mask and performing the, the seal check. You have to do the seal check every time you are wearing N95 mask. Visually inspect the mask to determine if its uh, integrity has been compromised. <clears throat> check that N95 mask components such such as the straight, the nose bridge, or the nose foam material is not degraded. And because if this happens, could uh, can affect the quality of the fit and the seal of the mask. And if the integrity of any part of the N95 mask is compromised or it, or is unsuccessful to use the seal check, uh, then in that case, discard the N95 mask and try another one. Um, saying that, um, if you ask me what 
if we're successful to reuse um, the contaminated mass, first of all, it's a lot of work. Transporting is a time consuming, uh, a personal consuming, because you have to train a lot of time uh, um, the, the healthcare workers that are going to wear the mask and also the CPD personnel. Um, it's time for the CPD personnel to go pick up the mask and then uh, go and return the mask to the unit. Um, we were using two, two types of um, bags, a brown bag when the, the mask is dirty that go to the, um, the CPD department and a white mask uh, sorry, a white bag to return the decontaminated mask to the unit. Um, was also very expensive method, except the UV light, the other two methods are expensive. And this is why it's always, always cheaper to be um, uh, working together with a purchasing department and have the supply available on time. Um, if you don't have enough N95, uh, my recommendation is use for extended period of time. This is the cheapest way and the safest way for the wearer and for everybody. Okay, this is um, my experience that I am sharing with you and you have questions, we are open. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ginas, Dr. Simpluk, and Dr. Uh, Kakavu for the, the presentations. I think the, the last presentation highlighted some of the, the challenges on the reprocessing of N95 uh, masks. Um, if you have any questions or, or comments, please use either the chat or the Q&A area. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the participation of Dr. Freitas, Dr. Murilo Freitas. He's, um, he's one of the specialists in the pre-qualification medicines under the strategic fund, and uh, he's also available for questions and answers. And in the meantime, I have two questions. The first one, uh, taking the, the link with the Dr. Spina's presentation. I have a question here on the, the chat in terms of how many masks will be decontaminated each time over. Um, depends on the method. Um, for instance, uh, for the hydrogen peroxide vapor, we have a huge um, like a shelf, metal shelf with a little strap, and then we can hang there the mask. Um, around 60 max uh, maximum, and then uh, for uh, the ester rat, only eight masks every time, and for the UC light, only two masks every time. But UVC light is only 60 seconds, and then you have, and the good thing for the UV light is that you have the unit, uh, in the unit, you have the machine. Then you can um, do it anytime, and the same personally is doing. Thank you very much for um, the clarification. I have a question here on the chat for Dr. Uh, Steinpluk, in the sense that if we have no autoclave, is there any role for storing N95 mask in a ventilated uh, biohazard bag and reusing it? which means that if there's no change of uh, sterilization or disinfection process, can the mask still be reused? Thank you very much. So thank you for the question. I will ask also Sylvia to comment on it. Uh, so PAHO WHO recommendation is uh, to use the mask for up to six hours. Um, so in theory, if it's not used for the six hours, you can reuse the mask. Um, it's also a kind of recommendation from C US CDC. 
However, I think we discussed, we have the same web, WebEx yesterday in Spanish, and, and I think we discussed that, and Dr. Gnaz maybe can highlight the challenge for, you know, storage, the masks, and reuse that, um, how you implement this in, in the reward. So up to six hours, yes, you can, but many, um, Many precautions need to be done um, for 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 to to be able to reuse the mask without any cleaning process as well. Sylvia, if you have any comment on it, I will be happy yeah, to Yeah, it, uh, it's amazing the the imagination of the people, and I love to work with the, my nurses here. Um, they create like a board in the unit and they put uh, little pins and they put the, the, the brown bag. Each one have their own brown bag. Then when they uh, don't use the energy 5 mask, uh, they are out of the room of the patient, they remove it and go directly and put in the in the brown bag for with their name and everything. And then that way um, you have, um, um, very, you are very careful and you are not manipulating too much the mask. And the next time when you use it, you put the, the, the mask on and you have to, to put a new brown bag with your name ready to, to be in, in the board. Um, they were having plenty of uh, ideas and actually uh, they were very good reusing the mask. Of course, uh, they have to to be careful that they don't use more than six hours of continuous use. They sometimes depends on the, um, for instance, respiratory therapies can have it. Um, of course, if they go the, in the intensive care unit, probably they use the the mask uh, one mask in the entire shift. But um, the good thing that when you are doing cohort of of patients, you can use the same energy 5 mask um, with different patients. Then these are different methodologies to 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 use wisely the energy 5 mask. No, you have to combine. Uh, if you because some people say no, I don't want to storage my mask. I want to decontaminate and use again. Um, well, we are trying to offer different options, and I think we were doing very good all these months because I have few few employees that turned positive, and none of them were sick. Only one sick employee was uh, was sick for COVID-19, and was uh, he had quite outside the hospital. He was on vacation, and and he. It was a surgeon, and he had the the infection um, acquired in the community. Um, but yeah, we have to offer a very safe method. You have to be there in the front line with the people and working and seeing your hospital, knowing your hospital, and knowing how is the the, the structure, the movement of the people, and you have to to work with them also to offer a very safe method. One important thing I think for me was very, very useful and I save, um, I save a lot of N95 masks is covering the N95 with a regular mask and a face shield. And also the face shield we are um, reprocessing, we don't throw away. We are cleaning the face shield with bleach in outside, inside, and then leave with a name also, and we leave it for the next use. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ignaz, for your clarification. I I have also a question here, and taking the profit that you have the, the microphone and also the floor, if you could clarify if the surgical masks can be washed for its uh, reuse, and uh, if so, how many times uh, we can reuse it? Thank you. Well, it, it, and, we are, and we are seeing your face. 
on yeah. the screen, so <laughs> it, because it, it's tricky the question, no? It, it's tricky, but uh, okay. What happened in this process um, of this uh, pandemic? Uh, after around four or five weeks, the the Portuguese department say, "Oh, Sylvia, we are having." Um, problem with re to get regular masks. I say no, my God, no, no regular masks because we uh, we are implementing the use of regular masks in everyone. Um, and finally, two or three days later, or one week later, she said no, uh, we are fine. We receive a shipment of one million of masks or something like that. Not not only for us to share with the county. Um, that is the county employees. That means on also police, um, teachers, uh, everybody that is a county employee. Then, but in the meantime, what I did, I started to wash it at my home with hot water uh, because everybody in the beginning said, no, no, the regular mask is not going to last. But you have to try what you have in your hospital because maybe the quality of the mask is not too bad. Or if it's bad, of course, you cannot do anything. But if it's not too bad, you can try. It. And, and I did it at, at my home. I wash it by hand and put in bleach and, and rinse it and put a, a dry out, outside in the, the sun. Then I said, okay, let me put some mask in the washer machine in the hot cycle. Then I wash it, I put bleach, and then I dry hanging outside in the sun. Then I, I tested washing with bleach in hot cycle and dry in the dryer, and nothing happened. And finally, I iron the mask. Uh, but the, the good thing is you, you have to iron in, in the first um, level of heat very, very low because if not, the mask is a uh, ring. But um, it's perfect. It's perfect. You can reuse it. I don't know how many times because it depends on the quality. I did it for at least four times all this month and it's perfect. And I, it's funny because I wrote the protocol. Um, I give it to the administration, but the administration say, no, no, we are not reusing regular masks, okay? I say, but we have that in just in case, ready to use uh, the, the protocol. Um, and the other important thing is that we are making all the employees to wear a mask. Um, if they are in direct contact with the, the patient care, has to be the, the surgical mask, the medical grade mask. But if it's in the office, they can use the cloth mask because cloth masks, cloth masks are not recommended for hospitals, but um, if you are in the office, it's fine. Thank you very much for your um, clarification. Uh, I'm just checking if we have more questions in of the chat if we still have a couple of more minutes if you have questions or comments please feel free feel free to use the the, the chat um, i have here a question for dr um Sacabo in terms of the technical the regulatory aspects of the the masks just a second here uh, if you could make uh, any comments regarding the kn95 masks and uh, the regulatory aspects of it over okay thank you joao thank you very much for the question i'll make a, a small comment and also murilo Freitas here in the in the room so if he may want to add uh, something after it uh, would be very useful so as we were saying at the beginning uh, all the evidence we are presenting here is n95 and equivalent so in the table i was showing at, at the beginning i was uh, showing that which are the the standards that are considered 
equivalent to N95. So there we have the European standard and uh, the FDA standard and other two European norms that are considered equivalent. And also during the context of the pandemic, uh, the FDA issued an emergency use authorization considering some of the standards there uh, that are uh, considered equivalent now during the emergency of the COVID-19 pandemic. So for the, during, during the emergency, those standards, uh, I, I don't have the table to, to share now, but you can have access to the presentation, uh, are considered uh, standards. The whole standards are considered equivalent. The K95, the Chinese standard, is not considered equivalent. There are some models that are considered equivalent, but it's a specific list of uh, models. So uh, we cannot say the whole standard is, is equivalent. Just those models are considered equivalent by, uh, in this case, the, the, the FDA, and, and that's what we can say uh, for now. And regarding what Dr. Nath was mentioning before, uh, regarding reprocessing, reprocessing is done, uh, what we know and evidence so far and validation so far is done for N95, not uh, for this other KN95 standard. Um, I hope I have answered the question. Murilo or anybody else would like to add something? Thank you very much, Francisco. Uh, I'll take the, the floor to, to see if um, Dr. Freitas wants to comment on this. And I also have a question in terms of the manufacturer's recommendations for single use. Over to Murillo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Here's Murillo. Uh, it's uh, thank you, Kakavo, for your uh, answers. My my only additional information that I would like to share with you is regarding that it's important not only to see uh, information regarding to 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 uh, what kind of um, norms or standard that uh, product are. You, um, providing to you. It's very important as well to know about the, the manufacturer because it's good to have ISO 13485 in addition to have some kind of a certificate of compliance because it's important to know regarding to, to good practice they're doing um, for the manufacturer. So it's included, it's important to get from regulatory perspective information related to test report because the filtration, uh, performance, fluid resistance, features and feel or something regarding to, to fit testing, it's very important to know if these product pass through this um, uh, uh, testing, right? So it's very, very important to make sure that products it's okay with testings. Um, regarding to to Chinese products, that was a question that we received in a Spanish section. It's good to mention that uh, the the GB twenty six twenty six it's a, a standard from Chinese product. It's not similar uh, per se with other um, standards from Europe and the United States, for instance. That's why it's very important to, to make sure that the product could mention to you additional information related to, 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 to other standards that they are complying. Uh, many other products, are, they are having international uh, uh, market, so it's easy for for some to provide to you additional information uh, regarding to certifi certificate of compliance with or declaration of conformities. Even if for some they have uh, additional information related to um, to registration from an other NRAs, like uh, Australia, for instance. Uh, uh, there is another question related to, okay, if we need to do uh, a reuse, but the, 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 uh, the manufacturer said that it's a single use. It is true, it's a, a situation, 
uh, the, uh, that's why it's very important that the local authorities can provide some recommendations for hospitals and, uh, and health facilities because we understand, of course, after to reuse the product, you can, uh, uh, you know, you you can have a complaint regarding to the product because, of course, they um, they was made for single use. But that's that recommendation is interesting that to have it to okay because of the emergency situation is not for the regular situation. Uh, the the reuse could be applied, but only uh, and uh, as uh, based on the um, information that we are discussing here that was validated or using some recommended methods. But of course, the product you can uh, uh, do a um, uh, request for for any problems after to do applying reuse methods. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we still have one one minute if we have any final comments uh, from the panelists. Please feel free. Because I don't see any more comments on the... Um, no, I, I see. Uh, this is for um, either Murillo or Francisco. Which agency is ensuring that standards are met? Is it NIOSH or another authority? Over. Here's Murillo. I, I can say that, uh, well, it, it's a product of NIOSH ones. Uh, of course, the air uh, can uh, be commercialized in the United States and other countries. Now, uh, United States, they have a list of uh, approved non-NIOSH products. And I can share to you here in the chat, I can send to you the link for products that uh, it's currently approved uh, for emergency use only. So uh, the FDA, they are doing that. Many other countries, they are accepting NIOSH, of course, uh, because they have some kind of um, uh, uh, equivalence of the standards. Um, uh, many countries like Mexico, Brazil, uh, Australia, Korea, Japan, they have quite the same um, uh, requirements. But of course, to be called that NIOSH, they should have passed through the CDC uh, lab tests. So that's why not all we can call that NIOSH ones. Only those they have received uh, direct um, certificates from uh, FDA CDC. So that's why uh, NIOSH, it's not uh, so common for other products. I can tell you like um, the, the key nine, uh, key, uh, QN95, not all of those are accepted even for non-NIOSH products. That's why I will send to you um, a link. In addition to that, I would like to mention that the United States uh, CDC, they are, they are doing uh, regularly testing for some products and um, they are uh, updating that information uh, weekly. And then it's very important to, to keep tracking what products they are they saying that, that, for instance, the future performance is not good because of course we expect it to have more uh, equal or more 95% of future performance. That's why it's very important to monitoring what happens there if we're using information related to, to CDC. Other countries, they are accepting uh, uh, other norms from other countries because of the problem, because of the, the um, of course, we don't have enough uh, products. That's why for, for now, um, it's accepting non-NIOSH products more commonly. Thank you very much, Murilo, for the clarification. We, we will just wait for you to include this on the, um, the chat so we can close the session. In the meantime, if we have any, if the panelists have any final uh, comments, please, you have the floor. Over.
Oh, I just like to thank the rest of the panelists for the opportunity of sharing this panel with all of you and thank all the public for participating on the on the webinar. It's been a great experience. Uh, thank you to everyone for listening and for sharing this experience and uh, thank you to for the invitation. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I may also just like to thank the availability of everybody to um, be part of this webinar and especially thanks to Dr. Ginas uh, who kindly accepted the invitation um, to share her experience with us. It's always a pleasure uh, having a Dr. Ginas uh, working with us. Thank you very much, Sylvia, for, for, for your briefing and, and share with us your experience. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank all the, the panelists for their participation, to share in the, their knowledge and to exchange the experience. Just to reinforce that the, this webinar is both the presentations and the, and the recording will be made available uh, shortly uh, today after the session on our PAHO webpage, paho.org slash um, coronavirus and uh, the, the English version of this document, the technical and regulatory aspects of uh, prolonged use, reuse and reprocessing of respirators uh, in periods of shortage will be also be available um, late this uh, week. And uh, I see a last question here in terms of the um, approved list of N95 masks. This, we have a list on the technical recommendations and uh, requirements for uh, personal protective equipment that it's also on our PAHO web page under the, the folder publications. With this, I would like to thank you um, to thank you for the participation. Uh, and we hope to see you on our next um, webinar. Thank you very much. And you have a good day. You too.